Production and distribution of City Club Forums on Ideastream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund. Hello and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dee Perry, host of WCPN 90.3 Idea Streams Applause and Sound of Applause. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's forum, a panel discussion exploring the past, present, and future of theater in Cleveland. When you hear the words theater and Cleveland, your first thought is most likely Playhouse Square containing nine theaters in a one block radius. It's the largest performing arts center in the country outside of New York City. What you may not know is that Playhouse Square represents just a fraction of the genre bending, envelope pushing theater present in Cleveland. This year, both the Cleveland Playhouse and Karamu House are celebrating their centennial anniversaries. They represent a hundred years of creativity and performing arts each, helping our communities see and understand themselves in drama and narrative. Now, theater looks very different in 2016 than it did in 1916. Broadway breakout hits like Hamilton and socially conscious productions like those generated by Cleveland Public Theater are constantly redefining art, expression, and what it means to be human in an increasingly complex and interconnected world. Today, we've assembled a panel of local artistic leaders to help us discuss the evolution of theater in Cleveland and what we can expect in the next 100 years. Here today are next to me, Raymond Bobgan, who's Executive Artistic Director at Cleveland Public Theater, Laura Kepley, Artistic Director at Cleveland Playhouse, Tony Sias, Executive Director of Caramu House, and Dorothy Silver, Actor, Director, and Cleveland Arts Prize recipient. Let's all get started. <laughs> and where I want to start, Dorothy, is with you because you have a direct connection to the Caramu legacy, you were interviewed, you and your late husband Ruben, as a couple by Russell and Rowena Jelliffe in 1955, and Ruben got the position as artistic director for Caramu at, at that point. During that interview and afterwards, what sense did you get of the Jelliffe's vision for Caramu House? Um, I have total recall, so I will... <laughs> I'll try to condense it. Uh, they were a passionate and devoted couple to each other and to Karamu. Uh, they were the, there first thing in the morning and they were there last thing at night and they were fresh and bouncing the next morning as we walked in. Um, they were totally committed to excellence in the arts. It wasn't about hobby, pleasure. It wasn't about, you know, something to do after your job during the day. Uh, it was about a commitment that was immediately apparent and that demanded an equal commitment from the people who worked there. Uh, those were the days, sorry Tony, <laughs> when they had one custodian who took care of everything. <laughs> Uh, it was a marvelous privilege to be there with these people who became role models that were impossible to emulate because they were so specific and focused and their life was about Karamu and the community it was serving. Right. Mm. Yeah. But on the note of serving, you and Ruben served for the next 21 years from 1955 to 1976. And I'm curious if your vision, if your mission took a branch off from where the Jellifs were or if you continued down the same road. Well, they certainly set a standard with the emphasis on excellence. And they were very, very tolerant of 
the kind of explosion of creativity that happened in the African American arts. Our plays went from modest traditional plays uh, along with the occasional Shakespeare and so on to plays that were being written by often very young African American playwrights who had a, a boundless need to express their feeling about the society we lived in. So plays became rough, you know, sometimes street language uh, that was demanded by the society that was being described. And the jealous who looked like they were descended from royalty just took it all in. They were amazing people. They knew what Karama was about. They knew what it was about in terms of encouraging artists and nurturing those needs for expression. So in a way, we continued along the same way, but history came along with us, yeah. fortunately. I want to continue the Karamu conversation with, with Tony Sias, but I want to circle uh, back around to Tony after we um, talk about Cleveland Playhouse, because it was born in the same year as Karamu in 1915. <laughs> what was the, the vision of the, the Cleveland Playhouse founders, Laura? Sure. Well, Cleveland Playhouse started at a time in Cleveland, which we all know, was just bursting. The city was bursting with creativity and ideas. The population had increased 10 times over. And Cleveland was really starting to say, what kind of city do we want to be? And um, fortunately for all of us, those uh, folks 100 years ago said that culture is what's going to make Cleveland a great city. And so that's why you have, you know, culture and, commu and conversation, I should say, because we obviously have the, we're here at the City Club, right. that was founded in that same moment. Um, the Cleveland Foundation, which was committed to supporting this uh, great city. And then of course you have Cleveland Playhouse, Karamu, the Art Museum, uh, the Cleveland Orchestra. So the founders of Cleveland Playhouse were called, they felt a, an obligation to serve this great community by creating great art. Mm -hmm. And so those founding ideals still run through Cleveland Playhouse today. You know, uh, we're committed to artistry, we're committed to telling stories that matter, um, we're committed to nurturing artists and creating work that's substantial and entertaining. Sometimes we think substantial work can't be entertaining or entertaining that they don't go together. Um, but telling stories that matter uh, has always been an important part of Cleveland Playhouse. And also in 1918, so two, three years after our founding, Cleveland Playhouse launched its first educational program. So throughout the um, whole hundred years, artistry, excellence on stage, and serving the community through our education programs to help young people grow and prosper has been part of our DNA and what we do. Yeah. And it also makes me um, think, because of things that I've read about um, some of the founders of Cleveland Playhouse, that an art theater is what they had in, in right. mind. Um, experimental theater <laughs> sure. of, of the kind that, that um, Cleveland Public Theater right. is, is now known yes. for. I, I wanted to, to move to that, Raymond, because um, <coughs> James Levin had a certain vision for what kind of theater he wanted to bring to the Cleveland community. And, and I'm curious um, what your first connection with CPT was. Oh, wow, <laughs> my first connection. Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, I had moved to Akron to study with a, with a director there and um, came up to Cleveland because that was the biggest city in, in the region and encountered Cleveland Public Theater and uh, at first was a little, I have to say, a little skeptical. Um, not, because, um, not because of the work they were doing, but because the vision of Cleveland Public Theater brought together very high art, mm -hmm. great depth, but the sense that that depth cannot be in an ivory tower, that it has to be rooted 
100% in the community. I mean, you, James Levin, I mean, what a visionary. He starts Cleveland Public Theater, started the Gordon Square Arts District and the idea of that, started Ingenuity Fest, um, brought One World Fest together, and what a visionary. And he came into this neighborhood and said, you know, theater, it's awesome that we have theater downtown. And it's awesome that we have theater in, in many of our communities. There's no theater in this urban, dangerous, economically disadvantaged community. I mean, these theaters were formed at a time of incredible growth. Cleveland Public Theater was formed in response to, um, to the, the city falling apart, to the, um, the, the distance created um, between who lives in the inner city and who lives in the outer city. And, and this vision that theater can be the connector, that theater can connect all of us with the power of stories, but also can give voice to the voiceless, to the people uh, uh, who aren't in this room who have never been to Playhouse Square, and to take their stories and put them on stage and give them voice. So just like with Cleveland Playhouse, the idea of education, and, and it's true for Karamu, Karamu too, all of us, education is important. And for us, what's so important is that there is a seamless line between the work that we are doing and our partnership with the Metropolitan Housing Authority, working with children who live in public housing, that those same artists are the one creating the highest, most professional work on our stages. And that connection, that way that theater can help us as a community to speak to ourselves, yeah. that, that's the vision that James had and that we try to live up to. Right. Mm -hmm. I'd say so. And, and that makes me think, Tony Sias, of your background before Karamu. Education um, was a huge part of the picture, working in the arts for Cleveland um, Municipal School mm. District. Mm. But you were also connected with Karamu as an actor, director, as just a supporter. At what point did you say, I have to take another role a leading role? Well, in 1992, I came to Caramel for the first time. Uh, what brought me to Cleveland was I was finishing my MFA at Ohio University, and at that time, OU had a partnership with the Cleveland Playhouse. So I was a resident at the Playhouse for that one year and finished my MFA and then continued to work at the Playhouse, hither and thither. But I was invited to come to Caramel, um, and I heard about the institution by one of my friends in school, uh, Dipankar Mukherjee, who had then been doing a residency at Karamu under Sarah May. So I had gone to the theater and they were working on a production called The Hot Mikado. And a gentleman by the name of Mike Malone, a nationally recognized director, was doing the work at Karamu alone. And one actor was having trouble with his lines. And so they asked me to um, <coughs> coach him on his lines. But what I experienced was this incredible community of artists, this institution that was, every room was full of activity, whether it was education programming, whether it was a rehearsal, whether it was a stage reading. And I must be honest, I had never seen African American and that many people of color in one space creating art. Mm -hmm. And so it was refreshing and breathtaking and exciting and important. And I knew that I needed to be a part of it. So when you talk about education, uh, I, uh, one part of my life I worked at Murtis Taylor. And I'd uh, gone and asked Margaret, could I use the space to do an education piece? And Margaret had come in there and saw the work that was happening and began to talk about how important arts education was for not only Caramu, but for the city of Cleveland. And through that job and other instances, I spent 15 years at CMSD and the last four of those years, artistic director at Cleveland School of the Arts. And one of the number one things I've told young people about studying arts is this. I want you to master, I want you to explore, but use these skills and tools to be positive contributing members of society. Because be an actor, be a director, 
but allow this to strengthen your social and emotional skills. And that's one of the number one things that I think that we have to have a, a new uh, commitment to is arts education. And this is not just Cleveland. Our country has to make a new commitment because without that, it's an imbalanced education. And that's actually a perfect entree for where I want to go next and, and just mix up um, the answers because the elephant in, in the room in, in the country is that we are in a period when it seems like every day there is another act of unimaginable violence and inhumanity and, and I want to have a discussion about what theater can do, what the arts can do to respond to that. Is it, is it presenting escape? Is it presenting dialogue? Is it your view? And whoever speaks up first, um, I'll keep it going around after that. Well. Dorothy. <laughs> Dorothy Silver. Dorothy. I'm the oldest, I get to talk. Um, <laughs> I was fortunate enough to be in The Crucible, which Laura Kepley did a brilliant direction job of. <laughs> and uh, it was a thrilling experience. I knew the play well. I had not done it before. But the play, which will be done long after I stop talking, um, is a brilliant play about our society. Plays like this are not written every day. They weren't written every day when Miller wrote them. Uh, but it is a brilliant play that provides you with uh, an average Joe who becomes a hero because of commitment, because of principle. And the play which uh, moved the audience, I know, every night, uh, and I'm sure future productions will continue to do the same, is a play that answers the question that Dee has asked. It's a play that really points the way for the observer and the participant who delves so deeply into the material to understand motivation, commitment to society. I can, you know, I could go on forever with this. It's a significant play. And Beyond that, the act of doing a play is also an answer to our society. Because I think when you're engaged in a project that, where the mutual goals are clear of excellence, the obstacles of diversity are overcome and you learn empathy for other people, you understand them better in ways that in the normal society that we experience now happens very rarely because we still are so isolated one from the other. Uh, so I, I vote both for getting into a play as quickly as you can <laughs> and making sure that it's a play of significance that speaks to our societal needs. Well said. Um, and, and I'll just uh, go down the line. Um, Tony, uh, you were mentioning a speech by Jesse Williams um, before we uh, got on stage, and, and his words spoke to violence, spoke to inhumanity, spoke to many things that are, that are just hard to wrap your mind around these days. I think theater has a responsibility to convene people from all diverse walks of lives, life to come and experience a play. Um, that you may have opposing opinions, but it becomes the springboard for dialogue. It becomes a place where we can agree to disagree and as well as a place to begin to have conversation around solutions. Because I think that there's always a, a next step after a play. Mm -hmm. right. We have the experience, but how does that experience live with us? And how do we be very intentional 
about a next step, whether it's dialogue, whether it's a personal action, whether it's a newfound appreciation. And so we have to own that and do the difficult pieces that might, and I love the way you put it, uh, said street language. I just would have said cussing. Uh, <laughs> but street language is better. <laughs> that has street language and that confronts and that makes you uncomfortable. But that in that, it creates the next level of awareness. I, I want to um, have Laura and Raymond answer that question too, but, but another one that popped into my head as both you and Dorothy were speaking is that in those meaningful plays that you're talking about, um, the people who write them, the people who come to see them may be of the same um, community. How do, you, how do you open up that experience of, of seeing a play, of writing a play, of, of experiencing that kind of theater to someone who doesn't necessarily find a home, uh, doesn't feel at home in a theatrical setting? Mm -hmm. and, and you can either answer the first part of the question, Laura, or, or continue on. Yeah. Well, towards the, the first part of the question, I think theater is the place that reminds us that we're human beings because we're watching humanity play out in three dimensions. And theater, again, as Tony was saying, is a place where we can come together and look at the serious questions of our time. And theater is art, so it wraps those serious questions in issue in personal people, in people, their lives, their story, their flesh and blood. And so that we make that empathetic leap and we care and we can see the multiplicity of the human experience, that we can see it from all angles. And I think theater can be, uh, theater can be an incredibly powerful tool to start conversations, to start actions, um, that it, theater can reawaken our obligations that we have to each other. And... You know, in, in light of so many recent events, um, next season at Cleveland Playhouse, we're opening with the Tony Award-winning play, All the Way, which is about LBJ fighting to enact the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And there is a speech in the play at the funeral of James Cheney, um, where David Dennis uh, says, I am sick and tired and sick and tired of going to funerals um, for black men uh, who were killed by white men. And in that play, in, the, in that moment and in that play, he says, stand up, stand up, stand up. And that is, to me, going to be the most <laughs> powerful moment in that play. And then if we do our jobs right in delivering that play, that the end of the show, the audience will stand up and take action. Mm. I'm, I'm really glad you asked the question about sort of who theater is for. And I, I think the room is at least half theater makers, maybe more. And I, I think for me, the, the lesson that we as theater makers have to um, learn over and over again is the potential for our own irrelevance. When 9-11 happened, as Mike Daisy so brilliantly uh, talked about in his own performance, at 9-11 we learned that theater had failed America. Because when 9-11 happened, our audiences dropped significantly. Here we have the form that was founded by the same people who founded democracy itself who said, we, in order to have democracy, we must have this thing we're going to call theater, where we will come together as a community to struggle with issues of justice, with issues of, of do we go towards revenge, or is there another way? How can we move forward as a community? How do we deal with war? And yet when 9-11 happened, our houses were empty. This is a time where we cannot let that happen. And I think we need to think about not only who is in the house, but who is on that stage 
and who are telling those stories. Um, two things at Cleveland Public Theater that really reminded me of this. One is the Teatro Publico de Cleveland. We looked in our community, we saw, we saw a huge Latino community who were not telling their stories. We were all poor because we did not have the richness of their stories on our stages. And we simply opened the doors and gave them the tools and suddenly they were not only on stage, they were in the house, they were coming to our other shows. Suddenly this, uh, this whole route of communication happened so that when we were doing Station Hope, um, uh, uh, some African Americans came to me and said, I never compared us following the North Star to freedom, to the troubles of people crossing the border from Mexico. We have similar stories. And I think that's the power of theater. But as long as we continue to remain unchanged as a theater community by the events, if we do not change how and who we do what we do, then we cannot expect to be relevant. And I think the model of theater has changed dramatically in the last 30, 40 years. Um, the entire idea of how theaters are organized is changing dramatically. And we need to be at the front of that as our community and look at who is making our plays and who is coming to our plays and who are we giving voice to. Yeah. Well said. And on that note, I think um, it may be time to open up the uh, floor for questions. But first, Mr. Malthrop has a few words to say. I, I promise. I promise, yeah. <laughs> today, today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are enjoying a Friday Forum panel conversation on the past, present, and future of theater in Cleveland, featuring Raymond Bobgin, Executive Artistic Director at Cleveland Public Theater, Laura Kepley, Artistic Director at Cleveland Playhouse, Tony Sias, Executive Director of Caramu House, and Dorothy Silver, who has done everything. It, it says it right here in my script. <laughs> We're about to head into the Q&A, and we welcome questions, of course, from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our radio broadcast and our webcast, or our new live simulcast at the Parma Snow Branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library. What's up, Parma? Um, if you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will work it into the program. Please make sure your questions are brief and to the point. Holding our microphones today, our Director of Programming, Stephanie Jansky, and our Content Coordinator, Teddy Eisenberg. May we have our first question, please. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, want to thank City Club for having this wonderful forum. I want to thank Tony Sias for the statement about the recommitment to arts education. Thank you so much for that. Uh, my question is, we have a serious problem with our young people and violence and gangs, and I'm, I know all of us in this room are so concerned about that. How do you see theater as having any kind of impact on that, that problem? Um, uh, I would say all of us on this panel and the organizations that we represent and that we've worked for um, are deeply committed to education and many also indeed many of our other theater maker friends in this room are as well. Um, for us at Cleveland Playhouse, the work in our education programs, we have, we have nine different educational programs, but the two that I feel like are the most innovative um, are our CARE program and CARE stands for Compassionate Arts Remaking Education and this idea that arts um, have the power to strengthen uh, young, young people and to use theater education skills, not necessarily because they're going to become actors and theater makers, but using theater education skills to uh, help enrich the whole child and create 21st century uh, citizens, giving them the communication, collaboration, critical thinking, uh, and creativity to address all of that. So we have, um, thanks to a $2 million grant from the United States Department of Education, Cleveland Playhouse has, um, under the direction of our Director of Education, Pamela Di Pasquale, is piloting and programming here in seven different schools uh, in, in Cleveland, a program that is 
speaking to social and emotional learning, using theater to um, not only enrich the whole child, but also the culture of the schools. Because if, if theater education can only go so far, if the children are, are um, you know, suffering from poverty, if they're in a uh, environment that doesn't feel safe, so both with our United Way program, our wraparound strategy, we are, we are embedded in these seven different schools and doing what we can to serve the critical need. And it's, you know, the need is great. And I think we're all, you know, do, doing, doing what we can and, and hope to continue to do more. Yeah, I, th I think the research is really clear. Um, how do we, what works in arts education? What is really transformative? What has time and again shown how um, children who live in more poverty stricken neighborhoods than others, how, what is the kind of arts education programs that work to really have sub substantial change over time? Are long term programs creating art? So, really, um, what we've invested in over a long time right now. Um, 17 years at Lakeview Terrace, a public housing estate, Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority partnership um, that we've had for a, this long time to be there with the children teaching arts over a long time, significant time in an after school and summertime program. Also a program that really speaks to the idea uh, about gang involvement, about youth violence is our program called STEP, where we employ um, teenagers, mostly from low-income households. Um, last year, the median household income, household income of these uh, teens was $18,000 a year. And over the course of the summer, they wrote and produced their own play and performed it in 12 parks throughout the city. And, and what this does is not just impact these kids, but there is a repercussive effect. We know that when violence happens, there is a repercussive event. That, that, that the families are changed, the victims are changed, the neighborhood is changed. It's the same thing when an art event happens in a community or when a life is changed. There's that repercussion. Um, and you know, thank, thankfully to the Cleveland Foundation, we're going to triple the size of our education programs um, and we'll be serving 1,000 children um, by 20, uh, 2019. So uh, we're really excited about that and that opportunity. And at Caramu, we're redesigning programs and we'll be launching new arts education programs this fall. And what's been really important to us is that they are skill-based and sequential in instruction and mastery at the mastery level. Because I think once it is at the point of mastery level, then young people can benefit in all aspects of their lives uh, by the skills that they learn in and through the arts. Another question. Thank you very much for the amazing contributions each of you are making uh, to our cultural arts of the city. Thank you. Um, but Dee, I'd like to go back to a question that you asked earlier about the audiences. It's been my experience, and I've been to all of your theaters, that the audiences are pretty homogenous. And so what um, are or can you do to really bring the theater out? So particularly people who live in poverty, um, the theater is not part of their cultural norm. And so the thought of going to the theater, and you, some of your tickets are pretty expensive, you know, it's just not even a point of consideration. But last summer, I believe it was, I was in the Buckeye neighborhood, and there's a small park. And this park put on this production. They had dancers, classical dancers, and they had some uh, dramatic presentations. And so there was a small intentional audience there. But then there were just people who were walking up and down the street who just stopped. And I suspect for many of them, it was the first time they'd seen anything in terms of a dramatic production or dance. So are you thinking about doing anything? If the audience won't come to you, can you bring yeah. your production to the people? Exactly. And I, I think that's what I'm talking about when I talk about this model changing. That, um, you know, this last year, um, through a National Endowment for the Arts grant, an Art Town grant, we were able to expand this program we have called Station Hope. It happens in a neighborhood. They're very short performances. 150 artists came to perform from many different organizations. We were sort of a convener as much as an art creator. And these range from amateur students all the way up to the highest professional um, dance companies and performers in our community. And thinking about not just where do we bring our art, but how do we curate it? 
is a 90 minute or two hour long performance where we turn off our cell phone and we turn out the lights always the best um, way to interact with the community? Probably not. And so with this grant, we were actually to do several events throughout the community. We performed in CMHA housing to hundreds of people who came and saw stories that they connected to. Um, people like them and people not like them. Um, and I think that, that you've really hit on something so important that theater has to get outside of our own walls and into the community and maybe change what we think of as theater as we do it. And, and I wanted to engage Dorothy on, on that too because mm. Karamu, at the time that you and Ruben um, first started uh, in the mid 50s through the uh, up to 1976, that was also a turbulent time in the city and in the country. And, and I wondered if there was an approach that you had then that you see value for now in terms of engaging um, different audiences, engaging a whole community. Well, I'm I must respond. I'm delighted to hear the three panelists mm. beside me talk about strategies for audiences and engagement. Because for us, I must say, it was primarily the act of doing the play. Mm. Now, the act of doing the play was considerable because when we came to Karamu, and my recollection, I'm quite sure, is correct here, uh, we were doing plays six nights a week. Mm. Kids would come in after the Monday off on Tuesday and say, we haven't done a play forever. <laughs> <laughs> and we would run it for often six weeks. So the kind of involvement that was not just established by the act of doing the play, but the duration of the relationship was significant. But as I thought about this panel discussion today, I really realized I was getting older because I uh, am beginning to ask the question that I think older people ask, which is, what are we leaving our children and our grandchildren? And it obviously, strategic thinking about how you engage the community is a very important key so I'm thrilled with you guys. <laughs> More questions from yes. the audience? Um, my question kind of goes along the lines that everyone else is speaking about, which is engaging and growing for the next generation. So you all have talked about programs to engage um, students that usually aren't into the arts or students that are going through the hurt of poverty. But just also kind of talk about what you're doing to engage those kids that maybe they're not in inner city Cleveland, but they're in those suburbs that they don't see theater in school. So, you know, the kids take music classes, they learn the recorder, they learn how to draw, but those kids don't act and they don't see theater. And so they're not growing up knowing about theater here in Cleveland. How do we get those kids who may strive and maybe our next actors and actresses and playwrights involved at an early age to grow that love within themselves? Well, one of the number one things from the perspective of Karamu is a complete reintroduction of the institution to the community. And as we have had to navigate the most recent landscape, I think it's also served as a vehicle to say the doors of the house are open and open for all. And I think to your point, it's very important to have uh, a diversity in zip codes. I like to look at it that way because as I learn from you based on whatever lane I'm in, you learn from me, and it then allows for a whole kind of new mutual respect. And that's around race and ethnicity as well, in terms of this, this need for diversity and inclusion. Um, so as we continue to launch our programs, we are looking to have a diverse group of teaching artists and students, lifelong learners, grown folks too. Uh, to come and to take our classes and to be engaged because one of the number one things is that how do you engage the millennial population in a way that's relevant and significant because they are the patrons of the future. So it's important from our lens is to say what other forms of art and entertainment are relevant? How do you meet them where they are? And the voice of spoken word and poetry is very important not only as a passive 
uh, uh, audience member, but how do you engage in the process? So it's really uh, interesting us trying to really take a deep dive and strategize further. How do you engage the millennial population and how do you keep, keep them engaged to invest into the institution? Um, I would say to, to answer your question, at Cleveland Playhouse, um, over the course of the year, over 30,000 students uh, connect with us. And some of that is through the programs that I was talking about before, that where, we're, where Cleveland Playhouse theater artists are embedded in schools, in communities. Um, all of those schools are at or below the poverty line. We also serve uh, in two ways across the region. Um, we have a, a student matinees. Uh, and again, because we think that the work that's on our stages is absolutely relevant um, to no matter what your age. Of course, you know, sometimes the content is more <laughs> appropriate. But, you know, for example, for All the Way next year, I mean, that is certainly uh, a show that will be um, bringing in and there's funding to bring students into that. But then we also, at those matinees, it's not just about seeing the shows, but there's workshops, small group workshops, both before and after so that the students can engage with the ideas in the play and do a little bit of acting and theater making both before and after that experience. And then we also have another program uh, called our Classroom Matinee where we go out to the schools. And that's shows that we've commissioned and created that speak to the um, interests and issues in the schools that we hear from the students and from the educators. So we've commissioned a show about uh, bullying that has gone out. And again, it's the show, but also workshops. We've just commissioned another show about gun violence that will be um, going. So, so those are the ways that we um, try to serve broadly as well as in depth. And I, I think the other thing is just there is a multiplicity of institutions. I mean, one of the incredible things about Cleveland is the diversity we have of organizations having, you know, Dobama having Ensemble, uh, Convergence Continuum, Theater Ninjas. We have an incredibly rich community that, that goes well beyond, you know, not only just these three theaters, but the professional theaters. We have so many community theaters. So I think there are a lot of, a lot of opportunities out there for the community. Um, just, it's not, you know, no one can do everything. But we have an incredible network. It's really awesome. I want to congratulate all of you for the wonderful outreach you're doing. It's very, very impressive. I have been an avid theater goer for at least 80 years. <laughs> and the thing that draws me to theater is the complexity of the of the playwrights. When you look at, play like, at plays done by Arthur Miller, August Wilson, they not only tell a story, they give the context of that story. And too many of the contemporary playwrights simply tell a story about dysfunctional families without bringing the context in. Can you tell me who are the rising playwrights that the theater will be able to yes, depend on? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, Tony and I are both really, really excited about Nicole Salter. Do you want to talk about what you're doing next year? Yeah, well, we're doing a piece by Nicole Salter, Repairing a Nation. And I was introduced to the playwright uh, at Cleveland Public Theater directing a show called In the Continuum by Nicole Salter, which my lovely wife, Kimberly Sias, was in. Uh, but in Nicole, Raymond them just did a production of a play entitled uh, Between the Lines by Nicole as well. Lines in the Dust. Lines, Lines, in, the dust. Lines right. in the Dust. Once again, my lovely wife was in. Uh, <laughs> So I'm a fan of Nicole's because my lovely little wife likes her work. <laughs> That's what's most important. Uh, but this particular show speaks to telling the, uh, uh, dealing, a family who around a holiday period uh, 
the young woman wants to deal with the issue of reparations in Tulsa, Oklahoma, around the uh, Black Wall Street. And so it's a whole conversation. So it's a historical issue set in a contemporary context that is broad in, in, and triggers a very rich conversation. So Nicole is one, one playwright that I'm very excited about. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask Dorothy, too, because I've, you're constantly in something and, um, <laughs> in, and, and, and in plays by uh, playwrights uh, of the, if not the, the 21st century, at least late 20th. Is, is there someone whose work you said, oh my, um, that's amazing? <laughs> I, I find all plays you know, have a tremendous level of excitement because you're exploring often a new world, really a new world. Uh, but I'm, I must say, it's probably my age, um, I am drawn to the marvelous plays of the past. Ah. Um, I, I've done contemporary plays that I think are significant. Wings is one of them. That's a significant play about not just a person who has had a stroke, uh, uh, but, but how society regards that event and how the victim deals with it. I think it's a significant play. But I, I, can't, um, I can't forget the plays of the past that always seem fresh to me because unfortunately, uh, some of our problems never change, perhaps. Uh, and it, it is thrilling to revisit some of these plays, a la The, the Visit, and, and realize that indeed we must continue to work on this problem every day. And I, I am recalling, again, I think because of this occasion, uh, some of the quotes of, um, Rowena Jellif, one of the two founders of uh, Karamu. And I, when I heard her say to a, a State Department sponsored group of people who came to see interracialism at work at Karamu, and when one of the people who led the visiting group said, how wonderful, Mrs. Jellif, you have your institution now, everything is in place. Everything is perfect. Everything is, you know, it's easy street from now on. And Mrs. Jellif said in her, in her very, very quotable manner, my dear, you must fight that battle every day. So it's very interesting for me to go back to the past and resurrect plays that still speak to us. No question. Thank you for asking. I, I would say that and um, in my ideal world, we would do a classic play, and then the next night we would do a brand new play, and then we'd do a, you know, to, to have that going on, because new work is vital and essential to the theater, to our city, to our country, to the world. Um, you know, having writers who can speak to the present moment. And many contemporary writers choose actually to speak to a moment in the past that illuminates where we are now. And I think those writers who can make it personal, provocative, and socially relevant, those are the great writers of today. Um, you know, I, I, people who I'm just always can't wait to read what they're writing next. Um, Chiara Allegra Hudes, who we um, just had uh, this past year at Cleveland Playhouse, Stephen Adley Giergis, and then we have so many great writers here in Cleveland um, who are doing significant, important, nationally recognized work. Um, we, we have represent, rep, representatives of the Schmiedel family in the house today, too, so we're going to do a, a shout out to Eric Schmiedel, Eric Kobel, George Brandt. I mean, these are people who are working <laughs> here in our community right now. Yeah. And, and I, I wanted to say before Raymond says something that I have seen playwrights at Cleveland Public Theater whose names I do not remember, but I remember the impact of the play. They, they may not go on to a national stage, but they were local or regional playwrights whose work made me walk out of the theater saying, 
I'm not sure what I just saw, but I have to, I have to process it. I have to open my heart and soul to let some new ideas in, and, and I think that's, that's so important. Yeah, I think um, I totally agree about the classics, and you know, especially, it was so funny, we're all talking about Arthur Miller, who I just find so brilliant and deep. Um, but it is our, our um, programming agenda to support new voices, new ways of making plays, that not all plays are going to be written in a room uh, in one city and performed in another city ten years later, but that some plays have to have a different kind of life. Um, but, you know, in, we, we've produced 42 world premieres in Cleveland Public Theater in the last 10 years, and 35 of those were by local playwrights. And you're right, not all of those plays are destined or even meant to have a universal long-term life. But when they appear, they are live, and they are the community speaking to itself. And many of them are universal, and many of them have gone on. So I encourage you to look at the local playwrights, like the ones Laura was saying, and yeah. others. Uh, we have time for uh, another question. So far, we've talked about a number of things, but there's an elephant in the house, and that's money. Mm. Running a theater costs a lot of money, and whether it's the groups that you each represent, or some of the others in Cleveland, like Obama, or the Beck, or Great Lakes Theater, all the money problems have been publicized at one time or another, which leads me to my question. What efforts have there been, can there be, to coordinate the production so that you each are not maintaining staffs of carpenters, electricians, uh, scene makers, storage facilities, and even places where you produce your plays. Can I jump Go. in? I'm going to jump in right here first. <laughs> Just to say, um, <laughs> we're, all, we're all jumping. We're all jumping. Um, one of the things about all of us here on stage right now is that we make the theater. We produce the theater. We produce the work. So, um, you know, there, there are other entities in town where the work comes in from somewhere else. But all of us are committed to producing it. So that means we are committed to those craftspeople, the technicians, the production staffs who are, who are making the work supporting, supporting it. And it's, um, you know, as I said in the beginning, a hundred years ago, this community cared deeply about culture and supporting. And I feel it every day at Cleveland Playhouse, how much support that this community has for the arts and how important mm -hmm. it is to them. So at, at our organization, you know, the price of a ticket covers half of the expense to make that production. Mm -hmm. And so half of our, in, our, half of, of our revenue is contributed. It's from individuals, it's from people, it's from foundations, it's from corporations because we need that support. It's ticket sales, again, you had mentioned the price of tickets, and we don't want the price of tickets to go up and up and up and be out of reach to the people who most um, desire and need and want to see the work. So I'm not exactly answering your question about coordination that's, that's going on. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's something inherently in what you're saying. There's an assumption that you, I think you're making. Um, and that is that theater people don't know how to run businesses. <laughs> and I would just challenge that. And I would challenge, and I would welcome you to come to CPT, shadow me for a week, see what my staff does, and see if you could do better with the limited resources we have. One of the biggest contributors to the theater of Cleveland are the artists themselves and are the staffs themselves. I'd like to see you walk to a lot of other big companies that seem to be working efficiently and see their staffs do what my staff accomplishes. And I'm sure it's true for all of us. So I, th I think there's an assumption there that I would challenge, but I would put that challenge out there. I would love to get businesses into theaters because I think businesses have a lot to learn about efficiency that we could teach. And I think, and I think we have a lot to learn as well. I think we have, we have time for Tony to answer that question. No and 
Well, what we're doing kind of on the ground, hands on, we are partnering with Dobama Theater. And that I was so excited when Nathan Mata uh, called me and says, hey, congratulations on your new job, let's talk. <laughs> so they are currently uh, leasing space at Karamu and we will have our acting company and their acting company seeing each other, exchanging. But this is kind of laying the foundation for our authentic partnership. So we haven't said we're going to do this or that. No, let's get to know each other. Mm -hmm. So our first step has been an artist exchange program that one of their designers is designing one of our shows, one of our designers is designing one of their shows, and Richard Morris happens to be designing Octoroons, which will then be at Dobama. So that's how we're talking about it. Our other conversations have been exactly about how, how you share staff. So at some point, maybe it's an opportunity to say, we have one technical director or a, a group of various stage managers. There are no immediate answers now, but it really is talking about how do you get to know a partner? And I think quite often when you're gonna share at that level, you then are sharing a lot of other things beyond um, uh, a staff person. It's, is this a fit? And being authentic and developing that relationship so that you can really expand over a period of time. And so it goes back to your question about diverse audiences, that uh, the majority of my audience looks like me, the majority of your audiences look like you. But when you begin to get this, these actors coming together and a conversation coming together, it's an opportunity to then have that exchange around audiences, around staff, and about our audiences being more reflective of our com complete community. Right. We have just a couple of minutes left, but Laura, you look oh, like you have something just, you Yeah, I was just going <laughs> to add to that, that again, if we, if we start thinking about that we're bountiful and abundant and that you know I think all of us this idea of scarcity and and we have to hold on I, I think the more that we um, again uh, are, are uh, open in communication and I, I have to say I've been making theater in a lot of different cities across the country and Cleveland is by far the most supportive nurturing you know uh, theater the town that I've experienced. I mean, I'm looking out at my friends from CBT, my friends from Dobama, you know, Sarah May, incredible um, artists here today. And I think one of, the, one of the ways, too, is that by, and I love what you're talking about, this partnership, too, but how we get out there and that we're seeing each other's work yes. and we know what's going on and we can celebrate, oh, my gosh, the incredible things that are happening at Caramu, the incredible things that are happening at CBT, and know that it's not a competition among us, that we are all in this together to make this city great. There are so many things uh, I would still love to talk with you about, but it will probably have to be off of this stage because we're almost out of time. But thank you so much, Raymond Bobgan, Laura Kepley, Tony Sias, Dorothy Silver. Thank you for the great questions. And today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a Friday Forum panel discussion on the past, present and future of theater in Cleveland. And today's forum is the Lucille D. and Robert Hayes Grease Forum on Cultural Arts, made possible by a generous endowment gift from Bob Grease and Ellen Grease Cole in memory of their parents. We welcome guests at tables hosted by Borderlight, Cleveland Playhouse, Cleveland Public Theater, and Caramu House, and we thank you all for your support. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And this forum is now adjourned. For podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.